So these past few months have been pretty busy for me. You may recall from my last video that I accomplished an unprecedented feat. I recreated a basic Minecraft clone. I know, I know, this is something that's never been done before. Well, I wasn't satisfied. I was missing some core features that most people would consider a central part of the game. The biggest one, in my opinion, was multiplayer. So I went ahead and added multiplayer. Then I went ahead and added a bunch of other features as well. In order to code all these features, I had to dive into some complex topics that have had decades of research poured into them. So let me take you along my explorations of these amazingly complex systems. Real quickly before we begin, make sure to check out my brother's video after you watch this one. He's going to attempt to make an awesome build in the clone as it is right now, and hopefully run into a few funny bugs along the way. One of the core features that my game was missing was crafting. Clearly, mine craft without the crafting is quite incomplete. Crafting in Minecraft is essentially just combining different items into different patterns. If you combine these items into a correct pattern, you've discovered a recipe that will output a new item with a certain yield. The concept is actually pretty straightforward and you can brute force it and maintain a high FPS pretty easily. So how do you check whether the player crafted a valid recipe? Well, the way I decided to do it was just to check every single possible valid recipe against what the player crafted. I basically go through all the possible recipes, then start checking to see if the items in the crafting table match what the recipe should be. As soon as I see that one of the slots doesn't match, I immediately know that the player didn't craft this recipe. So I can move on to the next one. Certain recipes don't take up the entire 3x3 area though, and can actually be crafted in any of the slots. One example of this is a stick, which requires wood stacked vertically. In cases like this, I simply check every possible combination in the crafting bench. If the player matches the pattern anywhere in the bench, and there's no extra items in the other slots, then it's a match. This was fairly straightforward to code, and I threw in some other basic inventory features. Stuff like right-click dragging items, right-clicking a stack to split it, and stacking similar items together. Well, now that that's out of the way, I wanted to move on to the more complex topic that I had been avoiding, multiplayer. Some people may think that coding a multiplayer game is a solved problem. After all, several games have already done it very well, like Call of Duty, Halo, and of course, Minecraft. Heck, Quake 3 Arena was released in 1999 and was specifically built for multiplayer only gameplay. The average internet download rate in 1999 was 280 kilobits per second. In comparison, today, the average internet download rate is around 42 megabits per second. That's 150 times increase in speed. And if you get the highest end internet today, you can get speeds up to 1000 megabits per second. That's a whopping 3500 times faster than internet speeds then. What I'm trying to say is, if they could achieve real time multiplayer games then, Surely, I can achieve the same thing right now. Right? Right? Spoiler alert, it looks like I sorta can. It wasn't easy though. The first big decision you need to make is which protocol you'll be using, TCP or UDP. Before we can talk about TCP and UDP, we need a brief understanding of how the internet actually works. Now, the way the internet works is it basically sends little packets of information from router to router and dispatches that little packet of data until it reaches the target. This results in a giant graph of paths that a packet could take to get from point A to point B, and this is commonly called a network. This also means that you have some pretty hefty latencies between different cities in the world. For example, say you live in Chicago, USA, and your friend lives in Jacksonville, USA. You can expect an average ping time, the time it takes to send a message to your friend and receive a response, to be around 26 milliseconds, at least according to this website. You may be thinking, well, that's pretty darn fast, and it is. However, we expect our games to be blazing fast. In order to achieve a frame rate of 60 frames per second, we need to ensure each frame of our game completes in under 16 milliseconds. Well, according to this scenario, we've already blown that limit and can't get 60 frames per second, and it gets worse. Say you're in Chicago, USA, and your friend is in Sydney, Australia. According to this same website, 
you can expect an average ping time of 203 milliseconds. That means you would get a whopping 5 frames per second. That would not be a very fun game now, would it? So, how do I get around this? Well, the first thing you can do is set up a server somewhere between you and your friend. Let's say you host a server located in Portland, USA. This means that the game is running in Portland and you can get an average ping time of around 58 milliseconds, while your friend is stuck with an average ping time of 146 milliseconds. This is a bit better for both of you, but it's still not optimal. And it certainly isn't possible to play a real-time game like Call of Duty together. But we know that we can play games with people all over the world in real time, so there has to be a way, right? And the answer is yes, of course. But before we talk about how to solve this problem, let's get down to the nitty gritty details. Remember how I said a game works by sending little packets across the world? Well, in games, we want to make sure we don't waste any time, if possible, when we're sending those packets. Unfortunately, the internet was designed to support multiple different tasks. For instance, the same internet that you run your game on is the same internet that you can buy a $95,000 Tesla on. This means that the same internet that's responsible for ensuring you don't accidentally get charged for two $95,000 Teslas because, you know, it lagged and sent two separate transactions, it's also the same internet responsible for ensuring your character moves a couple pixels to the left in your Minecraft world. These two actions have very different consequences, and as a result, the internet has come up with two very different protocols. These two protocols are UDP and TCP. UDP stands for User Datagram Protocol, and this is the wild west of internet transmissions. TCP stands for Transmission Control Protocol, and it's the very stable highway system of the internet, albeit with some very major traffic buildups from time to time. And you can typically only choose one for your game, because setting up both of these protocols would be quite a pain to maintain, if you're an indie developer like me. So you have to choose UDP or TCP and I was stuck with this choice. You see, when you send a data packet using UDP, you basically fire that packet off into the void and you hope it shows up, but if it doesn't make it to the target router, you can consider that data lost to the void. This is just another classic case of the missing data packet. On the other hand, when you send a data packet with TCP, it will make sure that not only does the packet make it to its target, but if you send a bunch of packets, they'll arrive in the same order you sent them in. Well, they both use the same hardware, so how does TCP achieve this and UDP can't? Well, TCP basically sends the packet and then waits for the target machine to send back, yeah, I got the packet, and if it doesn't get the memo, it just sends it again, and again, and again, and again, and again. The default amount of time it will continue retrying is 240 seconds, that's 3 minutes. Imagine you're an intense round of Call of Duty and your game suddenly stops responding for three minutes. This definitely isn't common in the real world, but it is possible. So clearly, TCP isn't very well suited for games. Now, it can be used, and as far as I'm aware, Minecraft Java Edition does use TCP, but we can do better. Instead, we can use UDP's fire and forget method, but we can add a bit of additional code to help us out. We can say, hey, I want to make sure that this packet is reliable. Make sure it's gonna arrive on the user's machine and it'll arrive in this specific order. Then we can code some systems around to make sure this just happens. Then we can add an additional type of transmission that says, hey, I don't care about this data arriving on time. If it's out of date when it arrives or gets skipped, just throw it out. This is useful for things like player position. If you're sending the player's new position to the server every frame, and you suddenly miss one of the frames that tells the server where the player is, you don't want the server to wait until that information is resent in another 200 milliseconds, because by that point the player's in a new spot anyways. So we can use UDP and have a custom protocol that allows us to send important information that needs to arrive reliably, stuff like chat messages, monetary transactions, and more, in a reliable manner. But it also allows us to send non-pertinent information, like player's positions, in an unreliable manner. And if we miss a player position packet, we can just throw that one out. This may sound like a lot of work, and it is. Luckily, I found a library that does it all for me. Thank God for libraries. But wait, remember that problem about our friend in Australia having a really slow connection time? Well, we can only achieve a minimum of 146 millisecond ping time for our friend in Australia, given all the packets arrive on time, and we have no other slowdowns. 
Well, how do we help him out? And the answer may surprise you. It's time travel. You see, I was able to stand on the shoulders of some programming geniuses, thank you John Carmack, and copy what they did. John Carmack made Quake 3 Arena work in 1999 with horrible latency and low download rates. How did he do this? Well, he basically used something called a buffer. Instead of playing out the results of the multiplayer game immediately in real time, where if I move my character in LA, then you would see the result in New York immediately, instead, you would build a buffer and play the movements back at a later date and time, usually around 1 to 200 milliseconds later. This is also how you're watching this video in, hopefully, 1080p right now. YouTube is essentially sending you a continuous stream of data, but they just waited around 1 to 300 milliseconds at the start of the video to buffer a few seconds of video on your device. This is also the reason that many people would complain about the loading icon on YouTube way back when, as this stupid video won't stop buffering. It's funny how the technical nomenclature works its way into our normal everyday speech. So I did what John Carmack did, and I basically saved anywhere between 1 to 300 milliseconds of player position data in a buffer on the server. I also saved that data on every single client, or every player's machine. When you play your game, you move instantly, but if your friend moves, you actually see the results of that movement around 300 milliseconds later. For other events like chunk updates and load information, I make sure that data is reliable, and I show a nice old connecting screen while you're connecting to the world and downloading all of that information. There were a lot of other smaller problems that I encountered along the way. Stuff like compressing the chunk data so that it doesn't take a minute just to load the world, or synchronizing the times between the client and the server. Turns out all computers have slightly different times, even if you're in the same time zone. If you're interested in all those smaller details, I'll be releasing a tutorial on these concepts. Unfortunately, I probably won't release that for another several months to a year from now. Anyways, I solved those problems and was able to move on to some other fun details. The next big piece of code I worked on was ambient occlusion. Ambient occlusion is basically a way of determining how exposed every point in your game is to ambient lighting. In layman's terms, it's basically figuring out how to make little shadows that occur because of the basic level of light you see. For example, if you look into the corner of your room, you'll probably see a bit of a shadow where the corners of the wall meet. This happens because of some super complex physics that I'm nowhere near smart enough to understand, but I did understand one thing. The blocks in my game looked horrible without those stupid corner shadows. So I found this great article about how we can fake some corner shadows. This article was written by somebody way smarter than me, and they figured out there's only four possible block placements that result in the different shadows. You can have something like this, something like any of these, any of these, and any of these possible states. Depending on which state the vertex is in, you just make the vertex darker or lighter, and bada bing bada boom, you got some fancy corner shadows. Now, it's kind of difficult to determine which state a vertex is in, because if you turn your head like this, and then kind of like this, then rotate your neck around like that, don't actually do this, you idiot, you're going to break your neck. Then you need to check these three blocks, as opposed to these three blocks for this state. Well, we can figure out which three blocks we need to check by using the face normal and some fancy math. This was a massive pain to figure out, but once I did, I could create this cool world that's all red, green, and blue depending on the state. This was actually very helpful for debugging, I'm not gonna lie. Well, it turns out that I could also use this technique for smooth lighting, which I had some help with from Sam Shecky, and I could also use it for colored lights. I really wanted to add colored lights next. I could actually do this using the exact same code I used for calculating the normal light levels. But instead of using light levels, we use light colors. I know, that's a pretty big brain moment right there. Unfortunately, I can't take credit for this technique either. I read about this by another smart guy in another article. So I added some extra information to each block that determined the amount of red light, green light, and blue light it contained, then decremented each one to zero the same way I did for regular light levels, 
and the next thing you know, we've got colored lights. Well, I decided my life wasn't difficult enough. The same week I implemented colored lights, I decided I wanted to add support for any block type. In my mind, a block type is something like a stair block, a slab, or a cube. These all have different recipes, if you will, and I need to use the recipe for this block to construct it properly. But I also want to mix these bad boys into the chunk with the rest of the cubes. This is definitely not trivial, but it is doable. I probably implemented it in a very stupid way, but hey, I came up with this solution all by myself. So how can I add block recipes? Well, I can use indirection on indirection on indirection. Basically, a lot of indirection. First. I had to come up with a new binary format system to upload it to the GPU. It looks something like this. Instead of uploading the position alone, I upload the position and a vertex offset index. The vertex offset index tells me where I can look into a texture to see what value to add to this specific vertex position, which I then use to figure out the final position. So I upload a texture to the GPU that's actually just a list of block vertex recipes. Then, when the GPU goes to draw this block, it looks up the vertex offset for this specific index, adds that to the position that was supplied, then rotates it according to whatever rotation index we got, and ultimately it determines how to draw this new block type. Using this, I could finally draw any block type imaginable. You can upload new block recipes pretty easily using some YAML, and it will automatically project the textures appropriately and everything. I'm not going to lie, I'm pretty proud of this system. Anyways, that leads me to the point I'm at now. Alright, here are some interesting bugs I ran into while I conclude this video. So I've never really talked about what my plans are for this game, but basically I want to turn this into my own game with the help of my brothers who will be designing art and helping out with some of the UI and modding code. From this point on, I'm not actually going to be developing a Minecraft clone anymore, but turning this into my own game. My immediate plans are to add player and mob models and animation systems, add sound to the game, adding infinite height, biomes, caves, better terrain, and finally adding some gameplay mechanics like a true survival mode. I'll probably be posting another video with an update another few months or so, so make sure you subscribe and you can watch that video when it comes out. I'm also creating a series that goes into depth about the different techniques you can use to code a Minecraft clone yourself. This series is more about concepts than about specific lines of code, but it should give you enough material and proper challenges to code this yourself, assuming you already know how to code. Those videos should be released on a month to month basis if I have enough time. I also have a full time job right now, so I don't have as much time as I would like to create videos, code this game, and you know, live life, so <laughs> maybe that will change sometime in the future, but for now, you can expect videos about once a month, hopefully once a month, at the very least. Anyways, that's it for this episode. I'll see you guys in the next tutorial where I'll be talking about textures. 